Good evening, everyone. We'll just um, wait for additional people to filter through. Um, we'll be with you just shortly. For those who have just joined us, um, we're just waiting for a few more people to join and then we'll be started just shortly. Thank you. All right, um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we're very excited to share with you a taste of a few um, projects of, of confectionery retailers. Um, uh, my name is Andrew Lee. I am the president of the New York chapter for the Retail Design Institute. And tonight I'm joined by Diana Refkin, my vice president. Hello everybody. And we'd like to thank our sponsors for the Retail Design Institute New York chapter, Planet Construction, Shimenti, and Stylemark. Um, and tonight we are joined by four guests. Uh, we are joined by Bonnie Kyle and Jeff Wysokowski from Shoot Gerdeman, and they'll be presenting uh, Krispy Kreme. And we're also joined by Katya Pitterman from Sajo and Christina Wu from Laderac Chocolatier Swiss. Um, so first up, we would like to welcome to our screens, Bonnie and Jeff. Yeah. Can you can you see the screen? Yep, all good. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you for having us. We are going to go through um, a beloved brand, Krispy Kreme. We had the great opportunity of taking the brand and, and bringing it into um, into the city. They had a small presence at the time, um, but we were tasked with bringing it into Times Square, um, making it you know usable and an excitable experience for multiple different types of, of customers. Yeah, so you know, with any project, typical of, of our process at Shoe Gerdeman, you know, we, we want to start with that sort of big idea. And what's so unique about Krispy Kreme, they, they've been around since you know the late 30s, and they've got a lot of a lot of assets, a lot of sort of presence, you know, with their brand. And so, you know, with, with with our team, you know, we typically start off with this big idea, and it was all based around this idea of hot now and happy place. The idea of, of a happy place, you know, very joyful experiences but still sort of centered around the, the, this hot now experience. Um, if you know Krispy Kreme, they, they basically, they make their donuts in the, in the space. Um, they actually, they're, they're known for what they call the, the hot original glaze or the hot OG. And so we wanted to create sort of this transformation from a happy place to a hot now where we're sort of celebrating that hot OG experience. And what you see is, is it's sort of the start of what inspired our design team, you know, really building off some of those iconic elements of the Krispy Kreme brand, you know, from the, the the dots on the on the on the, on the twelve uh, count box, the uh, the glaze itself. You know, there, there's a lot of elements that we want to really dimensionalize 
uh, into the space in Times Square. Um, and with Times Square, you know, there's there's obviously there's there's a lot of energy and, and movement in there that we took inspiration from. You know, some of these images that we could utilize not only technology but lighting to really bring the space to life. And also with Times Square, you know, knowing the customer itself, you know, it's it's not just local. You're going to get a lot of tourists, um, both uh, you know, domestically and, and nationally or globally, uh, as well as you know, a lot of families coming into the space. And so we wanted to make sure that this was was not only a fun you know, engaging warm experience, but also included uh, an element of sharing, um, not only with the product, but even just sharing, you know, the brand itself. Yeah, and, and as many of you have experienced, you know, when you're starting to work with a brand, you want to immerse yourself in fully with their brand. So we start almost every project with um, visiting stores, understanding, you know, what the ask is and, and what we're doing for them. What sets Krispy Kreme um, apart, which is pretty fascinating, they make and manufacture all of their equipment that you know that you see when you go to see the glazed waterfall. Um, so we not only visited some stores, but then also went to their commissary, uh, got to try out some very secret recipes in the test kitchen, and then also importantly, you know, working with their engineering team to understand what the machines are doing, um, and then what could we do to enhance the experience for the customer if we can make things pop or add some lighting or you know look at different colors to make it a little bit more excitable when you're you're part of you know you're enjoying that journey throughout the space and then moving into um, the customer journey the plan that we had to work with or the building was existing which is no surprise right in the city uh, there was a couple of different areas that we had to combine into making this one space with different levels. Um, so working through that in the beginning, obviously to make sure it works for the layout, but then most importantly, taking those findings that we worked with the engineering team and understanding the constraints um, of some of the machinery, applying that to the donut theater where you could see it planned north. Um, they had a 270 line and then a 110 line of donut making. Um, those two areas were, you know, we worked heavily with their ops team and making sure that the location and just how they were laid out worked well with the flow that le led into the customer journey. Yeah. And, and, you know, to Bonnie's point, I mean, this, this is very unique project where, you know, it's, it's not only a, a big flagship retail, you know, experiential um, location, but we also have to think about this. They have to sell donuts. You know, she had mentioned the 270, 110 line. So they're literally, pumping out, you know, almost 400 dozen donuts an hour. And so we have to think about that as, as we're sort of crafting this customer journey. We gotta make sure that not only are we immersing the, the customer, whether new or, or existing into the brand, but we also have to make sure that they can efficiently and, and easily, you know, get, get in and get out, get their donut and coffee and, and on their way. And so the team did a lot of great thinking, you know, not only from a planning standpoint of working from, with operations, uh, with the Krispy Kreme team, but also thinking about how are we going to immerse the, the customer itself into the brand. So we we literally use the footprint of the space, uh, almost thinking about the queue line to literally walk them through, you know, the, the, the entire Krispy Kreme experience. So as they're coming in, they're picking up their Krispy Kreme hat and making sure they look good in the mirror. Uh, you know, Bonnie mentioned the donut theater. So there's a lot of thinking around how to not only communicate how the donuts are being made, but, but bring some excitement, you know, true Times Square, you know, Broadway style fashion. Uh, even along that line, uh, creating a moment where the, the Krispy Kreme uh, employees can open up the window and then hand out free uh, original glazed donuts to customers, you know, to get them sort of to, to you know, whet their appetite before they're actually, you know, placing the order. And then thinking about the, you know, as after they sort of go through the order pay, there's a lot of thinking around uh, operations, um, not from just an ordering standpoint, but just from queuing and making sure, you know, we're getting people in an efficient manner. Um, but then at the end, as, as they come through, you know, thinking through the, the donut sort of uh, eating experience, you know, the donut box experience, and a lot of thought around, you know, going away from traditional two tops and four tops to really thinking about how do we make sort of a, a more laid back, casual atmosphere for somebody to, to enjoy their donut and coffee, have some moments to, to share socially, and then get, get on their way. And, and through all this, you know, what I said before, you know, this is a flagship retail experience along with food service. So we've, we've actually positioned retail at the front of the store. So whether the customer's entering or exiting, they're, they're passing through those, those retail moments. And there's actually a lot of retail moments along the journey, which you'll see as we, we move through the deck. Um, but that's really important because, you know, with any, you know, person uh, visiting Times Square, you know, there's, there's that opportunity for that kind of, you know, 
uh, memorabilia, those tourist sort of, you know, merchandise. And so we're able to tie that into the experience to, to create a retail offering. And, and that, you know, once we sort of crafted the, the, the big idea and did all the immersive brand experience and the journey, then the design team started with the actual concept itself. And I think what's really cool, and you'll start to see this as we go through the, 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 um, the 3D renderings and, and the photos is that, you know, we, we use a lot of technology at Shoot, you know, from, from SketchUp models and, and Revit models. Um, but we still utilize hand sketching a lot just to get those quick ideas down. And, and that's what you see here, just, you know, an old school, you know, pen on trace paper with some, a little bit of coloring. And, that's, and what's really neat is that you'll, this really sort of stayed true throughout the entire process. Um, but this really starts to so this view as you're entering into the space starts to show that, that sort of dimensionality of the brand, you know, taking some of those iconic assets, such as the, the, the Krispy Kreme dots that sort of lead you into the queue line. Um, obviously the, the flooring itself, we, we had to make it donut color. There was no other choice. That was the, the logical, you know, solution. Um, and even bringing in some of those elements, you know, Bonnie talked about the, the conveyor belts being a, something that, that's very iconic to Krispy Kreme. And so not only sort of playing up that in the donut theater with spirals, but also sort of bringing that to the outside and having those carry across the ceiling and, and even in the exterior, it becomes a, a technology moment. And then lastly with here, you know, with technology and lighting, I, I kind of talked about that a little before, but, you know, that was an element that really was inspired from, from Times Square, um, but we could see that usually using that to really activate the space. So, you know, you can imagine some of those vertical columns that we attach uh, screens to that we could almost create sort of a look of abundance, but then also use that along with lighting to really activate the space. You know, the lights turn red and it really celebrates that, that hot OG donut moment. Yeah, and then moving into um, just next phasing, right? We're working through the design, going with what the client is giving us feedback. And then we're quickly working through, as Jeff said, you know, we have lots of different formats of technology we're using, but um, we're using, you know, a virtual reality format that we, you know, is not new to the industry. But in this situation was a, a game changer for us because it was the stakeholders can actually get into the model and interact with each other. I think at one point they were taking donuts and like throwing them at each other. Um, but just understanding how you can go into the case and pick out a donut. And it was very measured on how many donuts they can sell per minute, right? Um, and as Jeff's saying, that we knew that it would be a high turnover with just multitude of customers moving throughout the space. Um, so for having the, for the stakeholders to be able to go through that in a model together was pretty amazing for them. And it was great for us too, because we can get live feedback. Um, you know, they even had at one point sitting, you know, the donut box sits two dozen people. Um, they can sit in the box and see how that feels for spacing. And so it just really allowed us to interact with all of our partners, very easy and fluid um, pre-COVID, which is kind of crazy, right? Um, that we were doing this before everything shut down. So uh, the programmings that we used really helped us to be a lot more efficient in that, in that matter. And then, um, as you can see, you know, the finished moment with the programming and all of the what we could do for testing and, and the reviewing with the stakeholders, we had very little change, even from the original the original sketch that Jeff showed to this final photo, which is pretty not normal for us, right? There's a, there's usually a lot of changing that happens throughout the process. Um, we were very excited that we didn't have to worry about going through a lot of painful decisions. I, I think it just was a really great marriage between a great brand, great client team, great consultant partners. We actually worked with Shiminti on this, which is pretty funny. Um, they were great. So it was just nice to work with that whole team and, and, and the finished product is amazing. And as Jeff was saying for the store takeover, that's a whole nother level of consultants. And I'm sure if any of you have been in you know, that back wall activates where the glazed waterfall is. All of that just brings together this hot now store takeover experience that um, is unprecedented for, for this brand. Um, just some, some additional photos. You know, we, we also, in, in, you know, in addition to the interior, we also looked at the exterior, which was just as challenging. Obviously, there's a lot of stakeholders, you know, from the client to the landlord. Um, but we definitely wanted to create some, some iconic moments along that exterior uh, front. I, um, obviously, you see here on the left, the, the, the large uh, hot now light. There's actually the, the world's largest is on top of the, the building spinning. And that was, that was a huge win for the team because that was something that needed to be very iconic, you know, something that you'll, 
you'll see every time you, you visit Times Square. I think actually on the, 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 good, uh, the good Morning America, you actually see it as a backdrop at times. Mm -hmm. So we wanted that to be very clear on, on the, on the um, exterior itself. I talked a little bit about the, the conveyor belts being that sort of a, a continuation of what's happening on the inside and allowing that to, to really activate the exterior. Um, not the greatest photo. We haven't had a chance to do any professional photography yet, but you see here, you know, one of the really unique things of this location is that it's a walk-up window. And that was really in, in, in response to um, thinking about the customer in New York City. You know, obviously you're going to have a lot of tourists, you know, people from out of town coming in and they want to go inside and experience the brand. But there still is a lot of, of New Yorkers that, that want to be able to enjoy Krispy Kreme and, and sort of, you know, skip the crowd, skip the line. And so we created this 24-7 and it does have a limited menu. Uh, walk-up window that allows uh, customers to kind of get in and get out and, and get their sort of favorite OG and cup of coffee. Uh, here to the right then, you know, Bonnie talked about the, the box that fits 12 dozen people, um, or a dozen people, sorry, 12, not 12 dozen, um, <laughs> two dozen. Um, but, you know, this is a really fun, you know, moment. Uh, it creates a very, very casual, very, you know, stadium scene is something you're seeing a lot more in, in restaurant environments, and, and we sort of, this is our take on it, you know, using the scale of the, the Krispy Kreme box, but it also creates a really great photo op moment. You know, that's something that was very important in this space is making sure, you know, I talked about sharing before and, you know, there's this sort of large hot now, hot now, hot now sign um, that works both in the interior and exterior and becomes a backdrop for, for those photo op moments. And this box also creates that sort of, you know, sort of backdrop or, or seating area to allow you to enjoy that donut theater that's happening uh, opposite on this photo. Yeah, and then as Jeff said in the beginning, you know, we started with retail in the front, um, really working with their, with Krispy Kreme's merchandising team, wanted to provide not only beautiful fixturing, but flexible fixturing um, to have different products, you know, on this wall fixture as you're seeing, but also for the freestanding fixtures, having some impulse fixture available um, at the checkout and freestanding. And then throughout the space, everything is mobile, right? Um, so we're trying to move things around. So if they wanna have a event or something that they need more space, they're able to do that with just ha having the fixtures be mobile. Yeah, we worked real closely with Krispy Kreme's merchant team. You know, we had these kind of initial, you know, flexible fixtures, but making sure like it, it held the right assortment. So we were literally going skew by skew to make sure that we had, you know, the right type of hardware and accessories that worked with, with the type of merchandise that they were offering in the space. And, and then lastly, you know, just a view from the back as you're exiting, you know, this is just kind of another sort of uh, viewpoint of it. I think what's really interesting too, just kind of reiterate that sort of idea of the donut theater and, you know, that, that you kind of see the, the, the thematic glaze sort of spilling out onto the concrete floor. You know, that was one of those initial concepts that you really didn't think was going to make it to the final. And so, uh, you know, Bonnie and, and her architectural team uh, did a really nice job of, of detailing that out, making sure that, that the, the design team sort of, you know, vision really came to life. And, and that whole donut theater was, was amazing with the amount of, you know, uh, coordination that went along, you know, not just, you know, design and construction, but operations, there's a digital component to it, even the engineer to get, you know, the spiral conveyor belts to actually work with the production of their, of their uh, original glazed donuts. You know, it was just really spectacular how that all came together. And, you know, we could be more happy, you know, to really see this project come to life. Um, we have actually haven't got to see it in person yet. So um, looking forward uh, when that day comes to actually, you know, walk inside and uh, get some, get some hopefully free donuts, but uh, yeah, yeah, so. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you both. Um, great project and great to see it. And hopefully we too can see it in person um, sometime soon um, as a New York chapter. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Katya Peterman uh, from Sejo, um, uh, who will present Lada Rock. Katya, hello, there? hello everyone. Just give me one second. Trying to share, share the screen at the same time. Yeah. Um, multitasking doesn't always work. Give me one little second, please. Okay. Um, let me know if you see my screen. Yep. Great. 
So um, for those of you who need a little bit more of an introduction uh, about Sagio, we are a company based out of Canada. We have a great presence in Canada and in Europe. We're happy to report that we also have offices in Miami and we are uh, unrolling our offices in New York. Um, we have offices also um, in um, Nebraska and um, company has been around for over 40 years with focus on the luxury retail um, offices and public works. Um, we're happy to say that our relationship with Ladderac started with a store in Toronto. Um, but what I also wanted to say uh, in terms of our services, um, there is an amazing opportunity that company offers for the clients and designers as well. We can support um, designers and the clients along the way, starting in, in a design phase construction uh, during procurement and maintenance as well. So one of the things that um, we got uh, a head start, not in the, in the front line, but a head start in 2017 when we incorporated our technology, the digital bridge as part of our uh, standard services. And this helped us along the way on a project as Ladderac in New York City. Um, just to give you a little bit of color, the project in New York started in December 2019 and we started with Gusto and everything was going great up until we had to pause our construction uh, in mid-March. And project was frozen for a while up until we restarted it back, we restarted back in uh, September of 2020. And there was an interesting angle um, working with an international team uh, on a construction site uh, in the middle of pandemic where there was a restricted travel from every possible country that the, this is an international project and we have local subcontractors. I was present on site during the construction most of the time. And the great part was that we were able to take advantage of the technology that was available to us and create immersive records, do the scans of our progress and share this uh, with our um, client and our design team and our mill working team. So they have a visibility of how things are progressing. This is a very large space for something to be considered as a flagship store, I think. Um, Ladder Act, this is a bold move and it's um, a brave move to open a store like this on Fifth Avenue in the middle of pandemic. It has, the store has three levels. The ground, uh, the ground floor is a customer serving experience. We have um, the image actually on the right over here. It uh, shows to you the, the experience that the customer has uh, in double height space, um, all the amazing chocolate. And it truly smells amazing. And uh, on a day when you're not, you're feeling down and they need a little pick me up, that is definitely a space to stop by. Uh, we have a back uh, area on the ground floor that shows um, uh, kitchen prep where the chocolate is made and customers get an opportunity to see in and see how the chocolate is made. The cellular level, which is substantial, um, it's actually it's an e-commerce experience where uh, internet orders are fulfilled. And then there is a mezzanine level that uh, has offices and potential training facilities for going forward later on. Um, I think one of the things that I am truly grateful for with all the things combined in the sense of retail challenges that we were able to open the store in time for a big, um, uh, shopping experience during uh, end of November, early December in the year 2020. And it's truly hard to imagine that this was done 
in the middle of the pandemic and customers were happy to come in and take a look and see what was going on. We had a lot of shoppers. Um, if I have the time and, and you tell me if I can share also the screen, how the, our Metaport scans looks like, um, please let me know if I have a moment for a brief walkthrough. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful, thank you. Just give me one little second. Um, so please let me know if you can see the cocoa bin. Yes, we, yes, can. we can see that. Wonderful, thank you. So this is this is how the Metaport scan looks like. And this is, I believe, one of the great things that truly offers the opportunity to, to walk through the space and see what is happening inside the space. So in the front of the house, this magical dreamland that any chocolate lover has. You have all this chocolate and this is a praline counter. The glass wall in the back offers a view into the kitchen prep area with the chocolate tanks. And this is, um, the, the, the scan was done um, before everything was mobilized, but this is already uh, rolling um, and hopefully it will open soon as well. And it's just, it's, it's amazing to see um, with this technology also, you can zoom in as close as you can and actually take a look at everything that is inside the store. The client has the opportunity to explore every level and um, they can, you know, tell, well, you know, I would like to zoom in and see where the conflicts potentially are or how were you able to find the solution where the, you have a perfect architectural drawings and in, in perfect field conditions. How can we work on this and how we can improve this? So you, we have the opportunity to actually show how things worked out and what solutions were found. So it truly, this um, digital bridge truly gives an opportunity of bridging the field and the international teams together which was, I am truly grateful for. Um, I believe my presentation might have been shorter than our previous um, presenter, but um, I'm hoping to answer any questions you may have later on. This is all for now. Great, thank you. Um, what we can do is invite everyone back on to uh, the screen. Um, and then we can go through um, some questions. And um, we are joined also by Christina Wu from Ladarock. So thank you so much for joining as well, Christina. Thank you for having me. I think one of the things I'd love to hear about more is the design process behind Ladarock's concept and where that originated and was it done more internally or was it a partnership? It's such a great uh, brand. Katya, so, did you want to talk through the process that you um, went through with, the, or did you want me to kind of talk about I, I, I think I will, be, because I was boots on the ground and implementing that brilliant idea. Um, we had the architects of record, this is a Valeria team, and they have been really uh, great partners in this uh, uh, design and implementation. But Christina, you may be able to uh, tell a little bit more about it. Yeah, sure. So our concept is very much um, uh, all about the five senses and it, um, it you need the five senses in order to truly experience the chocolate. Um, and um, Katya's photos, we have, you know, written in large print, um, as soon as you walk in the door, you know, the fresh chocolate experience from Switzerland um, in the store. And, and it, we really believe that our chocolate is um, the most fresh and therefore when you walk in the store, the, the feeling that you get is the sense of serenity. You get that smell of chocolate that Katya um, had mentioned that just wafts over you. 
there's, um, we don't um, employ music in the space. And so, uh, and we also keep the doors closed uh, for a couple of reasons. The first is to, um, to kind of create the sense of isolation from the rest of the world. You know, um, when people enjoy chocolate, they, they kind of, they want to float away from it all, right? So, um, uh, and it also helps to maintain the, the, um, the environment, uh, you know, we have to have a certain temperature and a certain humidity inside the, um, inside the space, which Katya didn't mention, but it is very challenging mm -hmm. <laughs> to maintain um, the, the perfect chocolate friendly environment. Um, and then, uh, and then on top of that, you know, the, the site of the chocolate, right? Um, you, we always have, um, our fresh chocolate counter. It's, it's the, the rows and rows of the chocolate bark, um, right in the window. And for us, that's theater, right? So, um, the, all of our chocolate is, is hand finished and handmade. And when you purchase it, um, it's hand broken as well by our store associates. So, and you purchase by weight. Uh, so that, that breaking of the chocolate and the, that choosing of, um, you know, selecting your own mix of, you know, a quarter pound of this and a half pound of that is, is very much theater from, from our perspective. Um, and yeah. Yeah, sorry. it almost reminds me of, um, how a perfumery or a very high-end makeup store might present and uh, express their product to the customer. Very, um, you know, like a luxury product, really. Yes. For, for a chocolate store, this is an enormous space. Um, you will find um, that there are many chocolate stores in New York City, but most of them are tiny and they're packed full of product. And you will find that ours is, um, is very open. There's a lot of room to move around. It definitely feels much more luxurious than, than any other chocolate store that mm -hmm. you go into. And, and the, the three floors is something that, um, you know, very few <laughs> other companies also employ. Um, the, the upstairs mezzanine area um, we hope to open for private events. So not just training uh, for internal uh, use, but also for private events. Um, the uh, live production area in the back is not currently open. Um, I saw a question about COVID and how we're adjusting to, um, you know, uh, the, um, you know, the ability to serve the full brand experience um, during this time. And unfortunately, we are not able to open our, um, our live production area right now, um, but we hope to do so uh, later this year um, when things kind of open up again. And, um, you know, we will be making fresh chocolate there, right there in, in that uh, space. Um, our hope is that we'll be able to customize um, and that we will be, have um, chocolate classes. So you can come in and make your own chocolate and you can customize your own toppings and, and all of that. So um, that, that is our hope that we will be able to get there this year. Christina, how many, how many stores do you have globally right now? We have, um, so it's interesting, even though we're so new to North America, um, the brand has been around since 1962, and uh, we are the largest chocolate retailer in Switzerland. Um, we are a Swiss um, chocolate brand. And um, globally, we have um, over 100 stores now. What I thought was really interesting between the two presentations was that both stores really do incorporate that process. Um, you see the production of the, 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 what you are purchasing in the end. And there's also that, that theater that Christina, you mentioned earlier about the, the product then becoming uh, uh, given to the, the customer. 
I guess a question for both um, both groups would be, has that always been, you know, the goal of these stores to really immerse the customer within the production element of of um, the experience, or is this really a transition to make it make the, the the spaces more, you know, experiential, relevant for, um, you know, customers today, or yeah. You know, It certainly is um, uh, a need. There is a there is a need to make our stores experiential. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that it is a flagship store, of course, we have to um, sort of uh, inject a little bit more experience into it. Um, the cacao bean sculpture that you saw is uniquely designed specifically for this space, um, and it is made out of real chocolate. Um, the uh, there is only one that's even remotely similar, and that is at our headquarters in Switzerland. Um, so there are only, we do have um, live production, and um, we call them atelier spaces in um, in several stores around the world. Um, uh, so we do occasionally. Um, create these experiential opportunities for, for our customers. We have some questions coming in from our friend Jose Padron. But maybe um, Diana, if um, Shoot can answer that, that same question for Krispy Kreme too. Yeah, I just wanted to add, it's, it's, I think it's pretty much pretty close to the same with, with Krispy Kreme. Um, and that's typically what they've always done uh, in their in their stores. I mean, they're really a we started kind of almost as a QSR sort of restaurant, you know. And so you, there's a lot, number of locations across the country, um, but that's something that because they you know have always made their own equipment in house, um, they're very proud of that. You know, they're they're from their you know marketing to to engineering team, they're proud of that that process. And and so that's something that's always seen in all their stores. Um, it's definitely they. It, it needs a little bit of update in some of their older stores. And so, you know, when we're coming to New York, this was, because it is in Times Square, this was a perfect opportunity to not only, you know, put that process, you know, on, on stage and really educate, you know, the, the, the shopper about how the, the, the donuts are made, but, you know, working with the, the technology partners and, and engineering to really sort of bring that, you know, to, to the next level and really elevate that experience. So it's, it's not only educational, but, but it is fun to, you know, walk down the line and, and you know before you order your donuts and was that that production actually you know embellished in a way to create a, a more theater within the store or like or like is it essentially less less efficient or is there yeah that that was the challenge is is they still have to i mean that was where we, their, their engineering team came in and we we went back and forth a lot because we're like okay we want to do a larger glaze I mean, the glaze fountain, you know, typically it's, it's not that big. And just even to get, you know, a taller glaze, you know, waterfall was, was, a, was challenging and a lot of back and forth between our team and theirs because there's, a, there's temperatures involved, food safety. And so there's, there's a lot of elements that you have to sort of, you know, compete against. But, um, but in the end, it, it worked out perfectly because we're, we're still able, they're still able to produce, you know, to hit their numbers from a business standpoint. Um, but we're, we're still able to, you know, entertain the customer as they're kind of going through that queue line. Great. And I think it, it, I'm assuming it, the store serves itself only and not other stores in the area or is it part of a network of stores? Yeah, they, they uh, Krispy Kreme, uh, Bonnie mentioned the, the commissary. So they, when they did come back into New York or sort of you know, reintroduce the brand. They they did create a, a commissary that that helps serve the other stores. But but all most of the donuts, at least from the, the production line, the hot OGs, all those are, are made you know right on the, the production mm. line right there. Mm. Great. Yeah, I think that addresses what uh, Jose was asking about the production location for the stores. Mm -hmm. And then I guess did Krispy Kreme run into similar issues with as Ladarak in terms of the operations of the production line during COVID or has it been full on? Um, well, when they opened 
I think that they opened November 2020, right? So um, it was a little slower for them, but, but their operating stores, they were really quick to switch to more, um, well, I mean, we had mobile pickup and walk-up window, but their other smaller store formats, um, they really utilized drive-through was a big concept for them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think COVID probably, you know, slowed down a little bit for them, but they, they were able to ramp up pretty quickly um, just by being flexible and, and nimble. And then are all the features of the store fully functional in, uh, in that production line within the store or? Yes, I, I maybe the tasting probably Samples. sampling yeah. right because you usually get one when when you walk through the line. Um, mm -hmm. That may have been probably a pause for a little bit, but um, we actually some of the team members went for the friends and family, you know, in November before they opened to the public. Um, and I think they probably weren't encouraging that you eat in the store, perhaps. Um, but mobile pickup was very busy, and the walk-up window was it was amazing to be able to see how how busy that was as well. I was lucky enough to pass through Times Square last week and the store was functioning very well. It was quite active. They were uh, perfectly socially distancing people. They had markings on the floor. They also had a little kiosk area uh, like many restaurants in the city do outside for people to stand at a counter built in to eat their donuts. And of course, I brought these back with me. <laughs> uh, they've been in the freezer. I'm gonna have one tonight. <laughs> That's a great thing to do. I didn't think about yeah. that. I'll do that. Yeah. Uh, it's it's uh, a greatly, it's beautifully designed and uh, it seems to be operating very well under the current circumstances. And then I guess a question for both both groups. Um, through this learning process, I think both, both teams have used digital tools. Um, Kasha, you, you, you use the Matterport to kind of really show us the space and should you, you had that, that um, I guess, virtual walkthrough. Are those tools that um, have really assisted the whole design process and also, you know, the, the, the build out process, um, especially in this remote um, setting that we are in today and are those tools that you, you know, are uh, used for specific projects or the key projects and or do you see um, implementing them across the, um, various projects that you, you all are working on? Um, so the amazing part about Matterport, um, how quickly you can engage the team and to be honest with you, the sooner we do this kind of scan and understanding of the space, before the design starts and we can share that we'll work together with the design team with the architects and show to them well this is what you're getting the space what conditions you're in and in early phases we can do a sort of evaluation with the help of a matter port kind of getting this um, building integrated software where we can uh, anticipate potential conflicts or what would be potential solutions. Um, this has been truly a rewarding process and appreciation from both architects and clients uh, getting this visibility that they're part of the process, that they don't have to figure out how they can make it here to this country with all the COVID restrictions right now. And it, it seems like in, in, it, it has been calming the, the need to reduce the travel and have a connection of it for the, the entire team that the client or the architect or the design lead can on their own time review the space, understand what is happening and kind of address the field team or the uh, design implementation team what's going on. So for us, it has been truly a rewarding process and it, we definitely see the greater need for it. Katya, is Matterport working in sync with something like Revit or is, is the project done in Matterport from the very beginning? I really, I'm just sort of So the, the, met, the, the way Matterport works, this is a fantastic question, Diana. Um, so Matterport, the way it works, you can uh, create it. So it gives you a feel of the space and you can truly make take the dimensions of the space, but uh, for greater accuracy, there are other uh, survey uh, tools out there. But in a sense, what it does from with a Matterport, you can create plans and elevations and you can start working already early on in the phase. 
And um, so th the, this can be also integrated with the building with, with Rabbit as well, further on. So the, the additional um, trickery uh, required from the technical department, but it's, it goes further along into the implementation of the three-dimensional uh, projects earlier on, which is truly magnificent. Yeah, I think we're gonna be talking uh, at some point in one of our upcoming uh, RDAs, RDI sessions about uh, technology and tools in technology and how they're being used on projects. Yeah, it's so, all so, so rapidly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say for, for, for shoot, um, I think we've, we've learned over you know, the past years that visualization, even for our internal team, um, we've utilized different programs over the years and also what is appealing to the client and, and deadlines are always um, being condensed. Um, so we're trying to be as nimble as we can. Revit has been a great tool just to get a very quick massing study that you can use while still being technical. Um, but even before that, I mean, Revit's not a design tool, I, I would say, right? So I think I kept saying, I think what sets us apart is that the hand sketching, there's still some romance in that. Um, and then, you know, SketchUp is a great 3D tool for us. Revit's helped us specifically with larger projects of if everyone is utilizing Revit, which is, is a little hard sometimes with certain firms, um, it's great because then you can have clash detection and seeing that if there is a mechanical problem that's interfering with our, our you know, our um, conveyor belt situation, which became something on site, um, with some of that we couldn't model every single thing on all the parties involved. Um, so that's always useful for larger projects if everyone is using the same technology, that's really great. I think for visualization, obviously any kind of 3ds Max, or I think in this case we use Oculus to actually interact with the model. That was really great just to get the experience across. That's a little harder to do with um, still rendering sometimes with the client. Yeah, it sounds like SketchUp is still one of the primary tools for that early project concepting. Yeah. Because it's so fluid, because it's loose, because uh, it doesn't have all of the parameters of building families and all of that. Yeah. And then Christina, um, being um, head of marketing, has the, the these kind of 3D visualizations of a finished store. Is that something that your team is interested in utilizing or is is to promote these these stores as well? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, they're very um, useful just uh, even before we start marketing out to um, customers, um, mm -hmm. but to uh, it help the landlords visualize the spaces um, because, uh, you know, they also have a, you know, a stake in the success of the um, of the space. And so they're also very, very interested in what it is that we're doing. And um, so, you know, the, the 3D models and the renderings are, are really uh, important for, for those stakeholders. And then from, um, yeah, the, con the, you know, the consumer standpoint, um, it, it's nice to have those to be able to start pitching before the store is even open. Um, but, you know, when there's a huge pandemic break in the construction, it, you know, that throws a monkey wrench into everything. <laughs> um, I guess like similar to how some museums and galleries very quickly shifted into a virtual format for people to experience those when they were closed during, um, you know, COVID. Do you see any, you know, desire to translate, you know, your flagship store into a virtual experience as well? Or is it going to be purely, you know, a physical experience in which, you know, customers enter and, and, and taste and smell everything? We actually have been doing virtual tastings. Yes, guided mm. virtual tastings with, um, with some of our clients. Um, it's not the sort of thing that we can do at scale, but um, we do absolutely enjoy doing them. Um, and so uh, it's, we 
tend to offer it uh, to private groups. So, um, you know, sometimes it's, uh, you know, like business teams would get together, you know, 50 people across, you know, international borders, and then they can, you know, um, take, take part in this virtual tasting. So we would ship them the chocolate. And so for them, they're actually eating. It's not virtual to them. Um, but uh, <laughs> the guided part is the is the virtual part. Yeah, it's really interesting to see how the the, the te technology can be utilized by various um, uh, people within the process, and then also once the the project's finished as well. So, thank you. Um, any other questions? I guess maybe just to help wrap up, um, favorite aspects of your projects or um, favorite elements of your stores? Um. <laughs> Jen, well, I guess I'll say. Yeah, there was, was, was a long pause. Um, I think the cocoa bean uh, in the front of our store, uh, the magnificent moving uh, sculpture, that smells like chocolate. That is my favorite. <laughs> it is It is made out of chocolate and it was um, hand produced in Switzerland and flown over to New York and, and um, Crutch's team had to install it and make sure that it was still all in good shape. Um, and it was, it was fantastic. It's, it's beautiful um, and it's amazing. <laughs> I can't wait to get hit by that aroma in person. Definitely worth a field trip later this spring. <laughs> Definitely. I would say that my favorite is the, um, is the fresh chocolate counter. Um, people come and they take selfies in front of our fresh chocolate counter all the time. Um, and it's it's very arresting to to walk by and then see these piles of chocolate in the window. It's wonderful. And then Bonnie and Jeff, what about you? First, <laughs> <laughs> um, my favorite probably is well, I, I can name two things because they intersect with each other. Uh, the the conveyor belt swirl that has the light chasing um, was one of my favorite. It was just. It was a great idea from the design team and it was just nice to, to bring it to life with, with our various partners. Um, and then the donut box, I just like how it interacts with that and that you're, you know, you're one of two dozen donut people. So it's kind of fun. I just like that every time we went to Charlotte to visit the client, I got free donuts to take home. That's pretty <laughs> My kids thought I was a hero that's because true. I come home yeah. from the flight with, with free donuts. So yeah. that's what I, that's well, what I <laughs> Wonderful. Actually, um, Bonnie, you brought up lighting, which I don't know if we got into in detail in, in uh, the discussion earlier. Uh, was there an outside lighting design consultant or do you do lighting design in-house? No, and thank you for asking that. We, uh, we use uh, outside consultant, uh, 37 volts, um, we partnered with her for, God, I don't, forever. Um, but she does great work. And, and we do a handful of, you know, theatrical projects. But we also do, you know, specialty retail, food and beverage, QSR, C-Store. And she kind of covers all of that amazingly. So we worked with the outside lighting consultant. And then also just for the hot knock takeover and that technology part, you know, that had to be heavily integrated with a technology partner. Um, in, in, electrosonic. Yeah, electrosonic, sorry. Fantastic. Um, well, thank you all for joining us. I think this um, has m made us all very hungry and now we need to go off to dinner. So um, thank you so much. Um, and uh, for those who weren't able to join us, this will be, this has been recorded. So we will be um, uploading it to the web shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.